And thank you to CIP for inviting all of us here. Um, I think that uh, Brian and I visited uh, CIP together a couple of months ago, and uh, it was great, uh, Brian, that you're providing this this venue, wherever Brian is, for, for us today. Um, and it's really good to see so many people out here. Um, my practice actually includes young adults as well as uh, children and adolescents. When I started this work 30 years ago, young adults were 18 to 20, maybe 21. Young adults are now 18 to 26, sometimes 28 or 30. If I stay in the business another 30 years, I think I'll cover the entire adult span. But I think that's because transition is a progressive process, and it's one where when there are special needs on the spectrum in particular, it's hard to know how much to push, how much to pull, how much to step aside, and it's hard for the young person to know how far they can go because really there is huge amounts of potential in all of us, especially young people with ADD or NLD and on the spectrum, and we want to encourage that. So as one of my students said, you know, the good news now is that they tell us we have unlimited pot potential. The bad news is they tell us we have unlimited potential. Okay? And that anxiety that that can provoke, you know, I, every, every time I do something, you know, is it good enough, well enough, is going to care, especially when you do not have a close peer group to measure yourself by. And I guess for my students in junior high, high school, and university or college, that's the biggest challenge. Okay? When there isn't a peer group to measure how you are doing, you don't, as a young person, really have a sense of that. Later in life, we hopefully get validation from ourselves, from a spouse, from close family or friends. But young people are wired to get validation from a peer group. And absent that peer group, there is more social anxiety that is created. So I, I don't know that the research exists, but my belief is that one of the reasons that social anxiety is diagnosed so often on the spectrum, or with NLD in particular, is that lack of peer group. If you were doing a job every day, and you really didn't know how well you were doing that job, you didn't quite get your coworkers, and they didn't quite get you. And every now and then your bosses blew up at you for something that really seemed to be beyond your control, you'd be pretty anxious too. And that's what going to school is, okay? That's what preparing for life is for a lot of these kids. So to me, social anxiety is actually a fairly normative and expected response in that situation. However, it's not helpful in order with moving on with your life. So that's what we want to work on. It's not weird or different to be socially anxious. It's really understandable. But you've got to rein it in, move on, get past parts of it, or develop strategies to move through parts of it, or you're going to be stuck. So today, my top 10 transition tips, try to say that quickly, um, are actually best kept secrets because they're not the standard ones. They're not ones about getting counseling, getting coaching, um, you know, making sure all your um, supports are available in the Disability Services Office. You've probably heard most of those. I'm speaking more about the little things that I've learned from my students that I think can make a big difference. There are handouts off to the side. If you haven't gotten them, please pick them up at the end. Um, I don't think there's anything I'm going to speak about that you can't keep up with, but a lot of this is already written down for you. So if you don't take notes, that's okay. Okay, so I started off with um, where to go, okay? Where to go after high school. And I don't mean which school, but I mean, should we be looking at university as compared to college, as compared to a gap year or internship? I have to put my bias on the line that I am actually a big fan of Ontario's community colleges as we now have them, okay? Uh, despite that, I had a son who went directly to university and wouldn't look at college, but the reason that for young people on the spectrum, I like community college to begin with, is that there are so many options now that we didn't have, whether it's articulation, being able to move from college to university and getting two-for-one credits, 
whether it's foundation programs where you can take a one-year certificate in foundations of art or media or police foundations and get a spectrum, literally, of sampling of courses to allow you to, to decide what do you want to do next. A lot of those foundation year programs, and I'd encourage you to look at them, actually are gap year programs from my perspective. They introduce students to a variety of studies. They get them used to a post-secondary setting, but they aren't boxing somebody into a three or four year program. They're also really affordable. So if things don't always work out the first time, and by the way, people on the spectrum are not the only ones who mess up in college or university, okay? I have plenty of other students who aren't on the spectrum, who aren't NLD, who do mess up in college and university. But if that happens, there's often a lot of guilt. There's a lot of shame with bright people on the spectrum who've been told they're capable and they can do anything and often had really good marks in high school if they fall apart briefly at college or university. And the guilt and the shame is there because it usually isn't the academics that get them. It's how do you deal with your co, co um, uh, your, uh, res the other residents on the floor? How do you deal with a professor who doesn't talk to you? What happens if you miss the date to book your accommodations? So looking at colleges from a small class perspective, a small campus perspective, and by the way, small might be 300, but it's not 1800, with a dais and a professor on a jumbotron. Okay, that's not education, as far as I'm concerned. That's cruel and inhuman <laughs> punishment. Um, but that's, that's the reality. Okay, so smaller classes, small campus, and here's the big one. Multiple shorter assignments that are marked and returned relatively quickly. The average university course is two papers and an exam. That's it. You don't go to class, nobody notices. You don't do your readings, okay. Now, I know that's life, but there's a big step between high school, especially for those of you who have been very advocacy-oriented in high school, to sending your child to university where no one has any kind of boundaries or guidance around those things. It's a huge step. So a lot of young people aren't ready for that. Okay? The other piece of my mind the gap or the watch where you're going piece is the gap year itself. I think gap years are often misunderstood. Okay? I think that they are seen as a place to go find yourself, to try to find yourself and traveling with friends is great, but it, you can also have very structured gap years. There are a number of programs in the city. Mygapyear.ca is one. There's a education and travel fair, and this information is in my handout, um, that exhibits for gap programs every year, and internships built into gap years where you can do work in an area you think you might be interested in, as well as perhaps travel a little bit, as well as do some charitable work, and perhaps take a course or two, are really useful things. What I do with all my students, whether they're on the spectrum or they're not, if I think they might be help, helped by a gap year, I tell them to apply to their colleges, to their universities, and to their gap year, all at once. And then we'll see, once we get our acceptances back, what's better? Because you don't see the gap year, or you shouldn't see the gap year as something you do just because you couldn't get in to the school you wanted to go to. You shouldn't see a gap year as something that's disaster planning. Okay? You should see it as one option. I also like it if my students can be accepted to a college or a university and defer, because you can do that. You can ask for a deferral and then do the gap year because it's really hard if you are involved in your internship, if you're traveling, if you're doing something else, and then you're thinking, oh, it's November, I have to send in that, you, you know, you act one on one application. Oh, I better send in my registration fee. Their minds aren't gonna be that way. So I prefer that they get their acceptance and whatever they choose, they have the option of asking for a deferral. So that's a tip I really want you to keep in mind. Where you start has nothing to do with where you end up but it has a lot to do with how easy your path will be and how smooth the journey will be. So please keep that in mind. And parents are often the ones who shoot down anything that isn't direct university. So if you're one of those parents, I would ask you to please think again. It's not fair to the kids. It's also wrong. It just doesn't work that way. Um, 
My next point is um, about transitioning to a college or university. I have called it move in early, but not often. Move in early, but not often. Okay, um, all universities and colleges that have residences are pretty chaotic places for the first few weeks. I would say for kids on the spectrum, Frosh Week is the equivalent of torture for most of them. It, it's completely chaotic. It's all about social. It's all about rule breaking. And it's all about limit pushing. And if there are four things that don't work, the sensory, the, the social all the time, the rule breaking, the limit pushing. And there is no structure. There's no typical piece to it. Most universities and colleges, if they have residents, offer early move-in when you have special needs. Take it. Insist on it. Okay. Get your child settled first. And if they want to come home or have a couple of days break in the middle of Frosh Week, I would allow that if it works logistically. I don't think you should skip Frosh Week, but I do think that 24-7, especially at some of the bigger party-oriented schools, non-stop socializing is not a way to start the year. It also makes them look a lot weirder and a lot more different in that setting than they would once school starts. So it's not a good way to make friends by this kind of exposure. Okay, so think about breaking up the Frosh Week if that's an issue for your child or for your client. Um, the other piece, move in early but not often, is for a lot of kids on the spectrum, staying in residence, even though it's kind of chaotic, even though it's not very <laughs> fancy, is much po more popular than you might think. Okay, most typical students after first year, sometimes after first term, can't wait to get out of residence. Because what are they going to do? They're going to rent a house with all their friends, and they're going to live whatever life they thought they were meant to be living. And that may or may not work, and they'll have great adventures. And if your child or your client can do that, wonderful. But I'd suggest that many young people, with ADD and NLD and particularly on the spectrum, have a really hard time sharing personal quarters, uh, changing roommates all the time, not knowing where they're going to live, and meeting all of their needs at the same time as well as school. So for a lot of young people, staying in residence longer works well. And so look for schools that have upgraded facilities or student, uh, facilities for older students where there is the norm that some of those students stay on. Many students, by the way, who stay on in residence are foreign students. And for whatever reason, there seems to be a really nice synergy between people on the spectrum and foreign students. Okay, because I think sometimes if you're on the spectrum, you might feel a bit like a foreigner yourself. You might feel a bit like you're an alien, you don't get it. And so some of the nicest connections have been made with foreign students. So that can be a really good match as well. My other tip about uh, move in early and not often is if you have a young person who isn't likely to want or isn't happy about residence, Look at a room and board situation. Do you remember in the 30s and the 40s and 50s, there were all these people that rented out rooms, right, and had a room and board situation to help pay their mortgage? Well, in college and university towns, there's still a number of those people, except they don't like to rent to students. They usually rent to professors, to people who are visiting at the school. Uh, often, they're people who run bed and breakfasts, but a room and board, breakfast and dinner, that's proximate to the school, that you can get to and from easily, it can be a real place of refuge for someone on the spectrum. Okay? It's true, there's not a lot of social around, but sometimes that break is a really good thing. Okay, I'm going to talk about a couple of other quick tips, accommodations, and I mean academic accommodations. Extra time is not enough. Okay, You need, on an ILP, and you need to help your young person get a extra time that says no more than one exam a day and 24 hours between exams. If my exam is three hours and I have double time, that's six hours. And if I finish at 9 p.m. because it started at 3 p.m. and my next exam starts at 9 a.m. and I'm writing for another six hours, that's tough. So watch for no more than one exam a day and 24 hours apart. Okay? Try to get the accommodation in that where course participation is marked, and by the way, in some courses, course participation is as much as 30% of the grade, the young person gets feedback along the way from the instructor 
or the professor. In most cases, a course participation mark is assigned, but it's almost random. The students don't even know what it is. They don't know the criteria. There is no rubric for it. And if you're on the spectrum, you're not really aware sometimes, are you speaking too much? Are you speaking too little? Are you annoying this professor or instructor? You can have midway points put in just to check in, give that information. Okay. Last accommodation that's a really important one is making sure that there is the option of a reduced course load. Many of my students will say, I don't want to reduce course load. I want to be like everyone else. I say, great. But if you need it, let's put it into your learning plan. Let's put it into your ILP, which is usually what colleges and universities call it, not an IEP, an ILP. So it's there for you. Okay, last one because they're going to pull me off. Okay, and that is my jello metaphor. Okay, you all made jello, I think, or something like it. Jello gels from the top down. Okay, when you put the jello in the fridge, after a while it looks gelled, but it's not. Okay, it just looks good on the top. The only way to check is to kind of poke it, and if you poke it, it erupts. It won't go back to where it was. It takes time for all these things to happen. And the best thing you can do for your child or your young person is to support them, to believe in them, but not assume that just because they got it on Monday, they'll still get it again next Monday or Tuesday. If they do, great. If they don't, they may need a reminder or some practice. They need to carry that heavier backpack to get used to what they're doing. Okay? Jello gels from the top down. It takes time. They may look good on the outside, but there may still be stuff going on. I want to leave you with a quote that I give my students, okay? You got, it's from Kenny Rogers. Um, you got to know when to hold them, when to fold them, when to walk away, and when to run. If there's anything from a social survival tips perspective, I can give our college and university students and their parents are those four things. When to hold them, when to hang on to what you're doing. When to fold them, when to tuck things away so you can prioritize, because you can't have all the windows open. They're not on your computer and not in the house, okay? When to walk away and to say, it's not my problem, it's not my business. And when to run, because there are times where our kids will face danger. You know, when my son was growing up, I told him that the world has very few bad people. Most people are okay or good, but the bad ones are actually really bad. It's not many of them, but the bad ones are really bad. I think that still holds true. Not that many bad people out there, but you got to know how to watch for them, whether those are professors, instructors, or just dangerous people. Okay. Anyway, I think you're doing a great job just by being here. I hope you'll continue to support your children, your students, in the advocacy for transition to college or university. And I hope this has been a good overview. Please pick up the handouts. There's a lot more information I couldn't fit into today's presentation. Thanks.